Uh, hi, I'm Mike Fink, and uh, moderator for the panel. Um, on our panel today, uh, we have Ira Shane, Albert Hastings, Chris Jones, Glenn Derry, and DJ Hauk. Her, uh, name's not quite in the order in which everybody's sitting, because um, I'm reading off my list. Um, I was going to do a little introduction of each person, but that means I'd be talking too much, and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to let each of the panel members um, in their discussion. We're just going to run down the way here, uh, starting with Ira, and and as the conversation goes, we'll see if we can uh, get a little bit of a conversation going, um, and then try to get to questions and answers as soon as possible, so you guys can check in with us. So. Um, I'll just say a couple real quick things. Uh, Ira, who is at uh, his own company, right? Yeah. Digital by Design, um, was uh, an animator, previous artist, and other visual effects tasks on many films, which you all recognize the titles of World War Z, G.I. Joe, Oz the Great and Powerful, Hugo, Stealth, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, Albert was. Uh, Formerly uh, at Sony, Giant Studios, Lucasfilm, Weta, Lightstorm, has worked on Smurfs 2, Jack the <laughs> Giant Slayer. Don't mention that point of view. I know, no, I, I like Smurfs. I, I, they're blue, and I like them. Uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, films like that. Um, Chris Jones uh, is, was a performance capture supervisor. Glenn Derry is uh, owner of a company called Technoprops, and a DJ who's from House of Moves. Um, we were trying to figure out what the debate was about, um, because uh, I'll just say this one thing. Back in the early days of motion capture, um, we, uh, there was a debate. You'd say, no, you should capture it this way. No, you have to capture it that way. No, you need this kind of data. No, you need that kind of data. No, you need rotation. No, you need translation. No, you need this. You know. And now, of course, um, things have gotten fairly refined to the point where, yeah, there certainly are levels of disagreement. And the most common debate is probably keyframe versus motion capture. It's just generally, well, are we going to keyframe that? Or are we going to try to capture that? And what are we going to do? So with that, I'll pass it on to Iris. Okay, well, I'm going to be the outlier here because I'm not going to talk about motion capture at all. I'm going to talk about keyframing <laughs> of uh, facial animation, and I'm just going to read Which is what, I was, here. What, yeah. what I was uh, wrote to, <clears throat> what I wrote for this panel. Uh, facial performance is critical to the success and believability of any animated character, and I learned this the hard way. I'm going to be speaking specifically about cartoony, keyframed facial animation performance and just highlight a few characters from different companies that I think work really well. There's the technical aspect of how to achieve said performance, and there's the aesthetic aspect. What is the face doing? What does it look like? How does it communicate to us, the viewer? Some of the technical aspects are building the morphs or blend shapes, uh, rigging those morphs or blend shapes with bones or deformers, adding controls for the rig, uh, some of the aesthetic aspects are the face shapes. Are they pleasing? Do they correspond to the topology of the character and how it's built? Uh, are the morphs or blend shapes fighting the geometry and how it's built? Also, do they allow the animator to do their job to the highest level possible given the time and money constraints? First, a little bit of background and perspective on things that didn't work. I was involved in a show called Itty Bitty Heartbeats, which was a failed TV pilot to sell toy plush characters. These toys were basically a cartoon heart with rubber hose style arms and legs. The facial features were humanoid eyes, nose, and mouth. No matter what I did, I could not build face shapes that I thought were appealing, that moved well, they didn't fight the geometry, and gave the animator something decent to work with. There wasn't any time to explore techniques, and we ended up sculpting the geometry when maybe another technique would have worked better. Animated texture maps or flat geometry that describe the facial features, more like a drawing, that conformed to the curvature of the cartoon heart shape. So the pilot was produced, but the facial animation of the heartbeats was creepy and very cringeworthy. Uh, another project that I 
<coughs> was involved with was Star Wars Lego 2, which were commercials for the video game. The minifigs were pretty rigid and immobile. With something so well known, to go against what you know is physically possible, their rigidity and immobility can work against you. So no deforming of the face geometry, which was basically a cylinder, to aid in the performance. Geometry that represented the decals of the eyebrows, eyes, and mouth on the minifigure were built as 3D geometry and shrink wrap to the geometry of the face. Then we built blend shapes for these pieces of geometry, and I was pretty happy with how they turned out. The rigging for the facial animation controls was very basic because there were a limited number of blend shapes. They had enough variety with eye shapes, eyebrows, which are not to be overlooked in a facial performance, and mouth shapes that there was a charm and a humor that played well. To dovetail off my last example, there's a Lego movie that's yet to be released, which will be released in 2014, with animation done by Animal Logic. Their minifigures have a lot of personality. The eyes and eyebrow shapes have a great deal of variety. The characters speak and have emotion. Lots of fun mouth shapes for lip syncing that are pushed to extremes to reinforce expression. Though in the trailer, I noticed that the Batman character has sculpted eyes that are part of his mask and those deformed to convey emotion. It works and for me, it doesn't take away from the believability of the world they have created. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is a show called Pocoyo. So Pocoyo is a human child. He has very appealing face shapes and facial animation using just eyes and a mouth. Very elastic and fun and very engaging. What the artist did with the animal characters to humanize them and make them engaging is top notch. For the most part, the animals have human features, though exaggerated for cartoony effect. Because it's a cartoon world, it works. The animal characters have broad emotional range and the facial animation performance reinforces the action and story without taking you out of the world they're in. Pato the duck character shows almost all of his emotion just through the eyes, eye shapes, eye blinks, eyelids. The timing used to create the facial performances for these characters while cartoony in nature is, I think, impeccable and goes a long way to contributing to why the characters work as well as they do. Lastly, I'd like to talk a little bit about a company called Mindbender Studios and the promo work they've done for Cartoon Network. Two pieces in particular stand out to me. One is called Pirate and involves a pirate character and his abused parrot. So the parrot in this piece is a stroke of genius. Its facial performance is all eyes and beak and it functions, I feel, as a helper to the pirate character who doesn't really have eyes in the traditional sense. The parrot's eyes bug out, they dart, they're a wonderful plus to the facial animation performance of the pirate, and they help the viewer emotionally connect with the performance that is unfolding. Another great piece by Mindbender, also for Cartoon Network, is called It's Magic. It involves two characters interacting and reacting with each other, and the facial performance and the character performance in general is way over the top. Their eyes dart around and bug out, they do very cartoony things like moving in opposition to each other. The animation is wild and loose and the facial performance backs that up. The mouth shapes are non-standard for a humanoid character and are really a 3D implementation of a traditional 2D drawn approach to depicting a mouth. In conclusion, cartoony non-human facial animation, while based off of human structures and the laws of physics, can be most successful when it plays against type, tweaks what we know to be real even if just slightly. Moving forward, I feel that keyframe and motion capture animation can and do coexist and complement each other, each having their own strengths and weaknesses, but both contributing to meaningful facial animation performances. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I have to ask you, you worked on Oz, is that correct? Yes. Were, you, were you involved with China Girl? I worked on the previs, and something that I'd like to say about the previs for that show is, they pushed that very far in terms of full performance in the previs. So we were doing lip sync in the previs, which I thought was pretty, I had never done that, gone that far, taking characters that far in previs before. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I did do a little bit of China Girl stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll talk more about that. Okay. <clears throat> so Albert? You're far more prepared than I am. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't have anything written down, but uh, I guess uh, joking about Smurfs before, but my background is kind of jumping the fence from motion capture to regular animated performances on the pictures I've been on. And uh, 
I'm curious just to know how many people here are pure animators. Good. Uh, what's your impression of motion capture? For faces, yeah. Yep, I think you straight away hit on the big point here that if you're capturing a human, it goes really well on a humanoid character. If you've got any other kind of character, there's quite a lot of manipulation has to happen to make it actually successful. And there's so much can be done technically, but at the end of the day, the animator comes in and saves the day. And I have to say, on all of the films I've been on, whether they're Avatar, Polar Express, Monster House, Beowulf, all of those, Jack the Giant Killer, none of them ever were able to just get a pure motion capture performance on the screen at the end of the day. It just hasn't happened as far as I know, unless someone was just budget constrained and couldn't do anything about it. There's a lot of limitations still. You can't capture two Navi kissing. <laughs> you lose a lot of the di facial dynamics when you're transferring it to a rig. Um, a lot of the expression and emotion is so subtle that it relies heavily on what we did at Weta was shot sculpts to get things that just weren't in the rig and weren't able to be captured. Uh, I think really it's a segment of the industry in its infancy. There is a long, long way to go with this. There's a lot of really exciting things here this year with uh, Paul DeBevick's project and Digital Ira. I don't know if any of you have seen that, probably a lot, but if you haven't, it's worth checking it out with a lot of detail, surface detail, which marker-based motion capture doesn't do. Um, I do see that there have been projects that have used it well and other projects that have used it in a very bad manner and kind of given the whole thing a bad rap. <laughs> But there's definitely a place for it, and I think the place is expanding. Um, and I think the old thing which I used to deal with on a daily basis was working with animators who felt they would never be appreciated for their work. It wouldn't be seen. I think it was anyone seeing it would think it was just pure motion capture. And then working with motion capture artists who would swear that the animators change everything. <laughs> but that's I, have to, I have to add that that uh, we're often not helped by, uh, on feature films by the filmmakers themselves mm -hmm. who uh, invest a great deal quite often into, let's say, motion capture, or facial motion capture, and then stand once the film is released in front of that film and say, this is all motion capture, there's no keyframe. <laughs> um, and what's that? Marketing. It's all marketing, right. Um, to just, I once attended a SIGGRAPH where I had worked on a film and the film had been released the week SIGGRAPH uh, happened and the producer showed up to actually do a talk. The producer of the movie was a very big Hollywood producer and claimed there were no visual effects in the movie that had just been released. <laughs> I'm sitting in the room. Okay. And Lee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> we'll move on. But, but quite often, you really have to look under the covers when you see some of these images that you all think or, wow, they did that motion capture, how did they do that? Or they did that keyframe, how did they do that? It turns out that usually what's under the covers is a whole other story, which is probably more interesting, more compelling, and better press than what's been put out, but it happens all the time. So DJ? Yeah. Yeah, you like? Um. Thanks. Uh, I mean, I guess I'll just kind of, my really super short background is uh, I got into mocap by accident completely. Um, literally uh, had gone through school for industrial design and came to LA at a time where visual effects was, uh, CG graphics was coming up and practical effects was kind of weaning because of the crossover. And uh, I'd actually taken both in school, but not specialized in either. And nobody was kind of like, well, you do a lot of that. You do a lot of that. And 
literally met someone at a, uh, a barbecue that worked at, uh, her husband worked at House of Moves and pestered them until I got a job. So um, uh, someone earlier today at a panel said, uh, tenacity wins over talent. Um, it's good to have talent, uh, but if you give up, uh, you won't ever get to uh, the job. And these projects that we all work on take years of your life. Uh, and I use the phrase, uh, take years of your life, quite literally. Um, but uh, I just, there's a little bit of background in, um, Motion capture has been really fun for me, and I've gotten to work on a lot of great projects. One of which, uh, with uh, several of which, with Albert, but one of which that I really truly loved was Monster House. Um, and this, I wanted to kind of echo a couple points which uh, uh, Ira made. And um, the there's an important thing with uh, with I feel of motion capture. I come from the motion capture background. I'm I'm not coming from the keyframe animator background but also from a very technical background of, there is something that existed in the world and uh, my job is to record that as accurately as possible. I know the accuracy of, with which we can capture things right now is at a finite level where there's, it can be improved. Um, and the important thing is about taking that and treating it with respect and doing it as well as can be done and then giving the animator tools to improve upon that. Uh, and I bring up Monster House specifically because it's actually a, I feel a great example where we use motion capture as a keyframe base and it wasn't a project that was trying to look like it was pure reality motion capture, uh, a representation of a, exactly a human being, but a, an exaggerated version. And that actually, uh, to kind of echo a point which Ira made in a few different ways was that you have to know what you want. And uh, it's all about using the right tools to get to that spot. If you know what a smile is supposed to look like on a particular character, there's a lot of different ways to get there. And maybe using motion capture as a base, or using keyframe animation, or using combinations of those two, you're always going to find that they each have something to gain from the other one. And uh, I think the, the hard and fast kind of the fight between motion capture and animation is and it exists, but it's not like it used to be, and probably more people that are in the uh, producerial level, level or uh, marketing that say, oh, this is all motion capture, or it's all keyframe, and there's no motion capture used, kind of perpetuate that a little bit. But for a large part, it's people that are realistic looking at what's available and using that and taking it, um, giving it to, uh, into the into the group and everyone working collaboratively together with what they're best at. Um, Glenn, cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I had so far. Right on. Um, I'll, I'll talk about one portion of the, that's still I don't know if it's a debate, but it's just kind of like a, 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 a there's a guy I've, I've worked a few times for named Jim Cameron who says horses for courses. It's like you're always picking the best tool for the job, it doesn't matter what it is. But um, there, there's, if there is a, a little micro debate going on, it's whether we're still using like markers on the face versus video-based capture and helmets and all that kind of stuff that's going on on the motion capture side. Uh, we specialize in, I, I kind of specialize in hardware development and sort of that world more so than strictly animation. I'm, I'm familiar with it, I've done a lot of work that way, but my, my emphasis is typically on things like how do you take a motion capture volume and put it on an actor? You know, how do you, how do you take and you miniaturize all the equipment? How do you make this stuff so that they're not wearing a, an alien spacesuit every time they have to go out there and do their jobs every day? It's a, it's a big deal. I mean, you want these people to be comfortable. They're acting and, and you have to like sort of take all of these things into account. So, so you're, you're left with two choices. You can, you know, in, in, in the older days, the, I would say like the, what, Beowulf, even before Beowulf, I guess it would be, uh, was the first Polar Express days and whatnot kind of the state of the art was was markers on the face. And then they went to levels where they were putting little elec electronic readers on the on the face. I think you've done a lot of work in that in that uh, bit. And you're basically limiting what you can capture in terms of the spatial area of which you can work in. You have to work in a very small confined space because you have to have a lot of cameras, a lot of equipment out there in order to get these finite nuanced performances in these small spaces when you're dealing with a strictly retro reflective marker. Now, in a way, it's a lot easier. You got a direct drive system. Those, those, those points 
go right onto your character in a much faster fashion. The tools are built for it. The blades of the world, you know, all the sort of back end tools are built for that. But when we were when we were starting Avatar, we were sitting there going like, okay, that really didn't work for us because we had to take a step back and go like, look, these we want to be able to have them walk around over a large space. Plus, we wanted to do real time, which was a whole different can of worms at the time. Um, so we kind of said we're going to go down video now. Now. We're not the first to do it. There'd been a lot of work before us that had done this kind of thing. Even even Jim had worked on a, 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 a digital domain, had, and a Jim, I'm sorry, a Rhythm and Hughes had done a Brother Termite before us. So there was there was precedence. We were not sitting there going, you know, we're out on a limb. Um, but we tried to refine the thing and make it as small and as comfortable as possible. And I think since that's sort of proven two things. One is that even a, even in standard definition, even in its lowest, you know commonality in terms of the actual capture that you're doing. When you're doing a video-based facial capture on someone's head, I don't care if it's multiple cameras, single camera, whatever it is, I always have the fallback position of having really good animator reference. Okay, even if, even if none of the markers work, even if, the, even if the tools don't work, I can always send that video to some guy and say, make it look like that. And that is a big part of, I know Mike's job, is make it look like this, describing what this is, what the performance capture, when you're doing the head, head cams, at least it unifies the performance. I'm not like having to describe it, there it is, make it look like that. Now, yes, of course, there's nuances in terms of how the rigging is applied and all of these things. But the unification of the single actor's performance is the biggest deal that I think. And that's sort of the leap that's happened in the last several years with these head-mounted systems and all that kind of stuff. Um, versus the sort of detachment between having to do things twice. I have to go do things in my body volume, and then I have to go do things in my facial volume, which is weird. It's weird. It, you're never going to get the same performance. It's never going to look great. The actors think it's weird. The eyes don't work. There's all this other stuff. So that's unification is the biggest, I think, stride in the step forward and, and the reason to go down that path. I don't even know if that's a debate anymore, but I thought I'd bring it up anyway. <laughs> and we'll move yeah. it on down to Chris. Um, so. I as well completely fell into uh, motion capture. Uh, I have a live action background um, in television. Uh, I'm one of the few people that was born and raised in Los Angeles and actually stayed here. Me too. Me <laughs> yeah. Too. yeah. yeah. Uh, I started working at 15, like doing video on the city council meetings, then post production sound, production sound, camera assistant, assistant pr uh, producing little things for television, cable. I did cable for a few years. And then I ended up, uh, one of these, uh, an executive had gotten hired by uh, Image Metrics, is when they hired me. They say, I need somebody that can talk to a computer scientist and then talk to a producer and make them hear each other. <laughs> because it was, uh, they were a small group of um, uh, just animators and computer scientists. And they would go into these shoots with these directors, these producers, and these actors and not know how to speak to them. And, you know, growing up in L.A., you realize that there's three different languages for each one of those, you know. And it's like you can only talk to an actor at a certain time in a certain way if the director's not there, but you never want to step on his toes and, the, you know, all the, the, those little bits. And uh, we started out, um, I've kind of been focusing, I'm like one of the, the odd, I never got to I, just dive in for a few years in a project. I've been kind of like the, the facial capture mercenary of sorts. <laughs> Where they just, you know, I'll be with somebody uh, on set for, you know, two or three days or a few months at, at most. And then, you know, we get some feedback as we go and then we move on and we go on to the next one. Um, uh, but one of the things we've learned is that there is so many ways to skin a cat, and, you know, just to tread on some of the water that they've already gone over. Uh, a lot of people over the last, you know, five, six years still had done that detached head, you know. We don't have the budget or the time or the resources to be able to get our principal actors into a mocap volume, um, especially a lot of uh, animation, television, and some of the, the old games guys, they had just, they're so used to just, here's my voice director, we're gonna do all these voices in the booth, and they're voice actors, and like, we're not dealing with that, that's, you go get the stunt guys out there. And you know, we saw how that, that disconnect that we've all known for years, is like you get this great emotive performance in the voice, and then you've got this super overdone, you know, the stunt guy over mocapped, and then you put it together, and you're like, well, that just looks weird, and you know, you can get away with it. With that, um, the more cartoony it is, the more you can get away with it. You start to make it more real, and then you just go, oh, kill it with fire. It doesn't look right, you know? <laughs> um, 
So, and then now, um, these days, we see more and more, as you know, Glenn does, the, the head cameras. Uh, um, getting all those pieces in one, um, I don't know, I feel like I'm treading on things you guys have said now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually really agree with, I mean, the, with both of what, what you've said is just the combining and having the body and the face performance together is absolutely critical. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the key things that you see is absolutely the eyes more than anything because your eyes will lead you a split second before you turn your body and your head. And if that timing isn't right, it just doesn't feel natural. And I mean, a lot of people will use that as something from Polar Express is the dead eyes, you know, and every project we all work on is it's the technology and the state of everything from the hardware to the computers to the graphics to the rigging, everything that you do at that time. And that was a big complaint at that time is the eyes look dead because they didn't have the, the subtleties of the quick motion that just is evolutionarily natural, like you recognize and you see it. Um, and that you, when you don't put them together, you get this overacting because someone's trying to use their body to express their feelings for this character and not just a combined thing which is natural of your face, your eyes, your voice, your temper, your pacing of your walking and your breathing together, all those things. and those really are very important. Yeah, so it's like right now you see the, uh, the markers and the video based is, you know, those are the ways you can actually do that full performance capture. And, you know, we've seen more and more mocap stages soundproofing these days. So, you know, now you've got soundproof stages all over the world when, what, a few years ago there was just a handful. handful yeah. yeah. Um, because it's just even with the eyes, but the, the inflection, the way you breathe when you speak, you see it in the chest, you know? Mm -hmm. If you try to pick that up, you know, two weeks later, it will never match, you know? I mean, but with keyframe animation, it's like, you know, the possibilities are limitless, but you've got, you know, the old cheap, fast, good triangle. You know? <laughs> I, do, I do have to say this, it sounds like totally natural that you would think that everybody, people would just understand, people we all work for, that, and they all, are creating media of some kind or another, and they would all understand that the the weight of that performance and the, the way it is carried is not just from the neck up, you know, that there's <laughs> yeah. like a, a whole other performance. And I do have a real quick story to kind of tell you about that, which is a film I was working on where we had a voice actor for a character in the film. Uh, the character was fully CG. And the voice actor was replaced with another voice actor um, 12 weeks before we were supposed to finish the movie. So we'd already animated the character to the original voice actor. Uh, and the studio proposed that they brought in this very expensive new voice actor to give a new voice to this character because they were unhappy with the other guy. Uh, and that he was going to come in and do ADR that we were going to show him the animation and he was going to create a voice for that, that other actor who was up there being animated on the stage. And I just refused. I said, no, you can't do that. He said, do you want to spend how much money to have this guy on the stage saying these words? He's going to move his arms, he's going to move his shoulders, he's going to his body, he's going to twist, he's going to be acting when he's saying the words. We have to start over. And got them to understand that we had to start over, and we did, and, and, and it was successful. But it was so easy for them to think that you just sever the head. Yeah. And Even a straight pop, jacket? What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Performance. I was sure. just trying to picture how we would try to get this act. And I, well, the, what swayed them, though, was not the logic of why would you want to do that because you wouldn't get the best performance. That didn't sway them. What swayed them was the fact that they were spending all this money for the actor and not getting full value, because they don't. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> they, they needed, if you're gonna get, might as well get the whole body too. Yeah. You know, you're paying for it. Yeah, you're paying for it, so that, that worked. Yeah. I think that's the challenge even when you do have the actor being captured on stage and performing at the same time, that um, like take going into House of Moves the other week for the first time in a long time, they've got an enormous, beautiful stage for body capture and a much smaller stage for facial capture. And it's like you said, the body capture stage just isn't getting that much use anymore. Yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, our, I think, I think it's like 85 or 90% of our work is all full performance now because everyone, 
is you know realizing that they want all these things together and a lot of people mm -hmm. come in and say they want Avatar. <laughs> That's yeah. this ends up being a literally <laughs> like, to me too. We Avatar. We, yeah, it's like can we do, do we Avatar? We don't have any money. <laughs> money. Yeah. Yeah. No money. We want to do Avatar. <laughs> but it's also also because ninety percent of the performance comes in from the face. Yep. Right. And if you've captured a body and you haven't captured a face, you've lost a lot. If you've got a Tom Hanks or uh, Angelina Jolie up there on stage acting, <laughs> um, you want that. So. I don't know how many people here have seen the show to lie to me. Um, familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's another one. Uh, Paul Ekman was a consultant on that because his expertise is in micro expressions. And he also built a system we all currently or commonly use for facial expression transfer to rigs is uh, a fax system, a set of mm -hmm. fax expressions. His show just tells you how small a tell is when you're looking at someone to know if they're lying, to know if they're hiding something. It's an extremely tough thing to capture somebody's face and just get all that. Have you, um, so uh, even in your experience of addressing the entire panel here, hmm? has, has anybody, who has a, a, an example in their heads of a uh, what you know to be a motion captured performance that you felt was really really close that that we might all recognize that you felt was really close to being about as good as it can get or or better you know that was surprisingly good you know what i mean I've, i it's hard for me to express this but it's just the idea that can you think of a performance that was motion capture driven that really surprised you by how good it was and you know that in fact there was very little keyframe done that it really was derived from motion capture or are there any that you just actually, love even even if they aren't that good there's a moment <laughs> which i uh i will say that uh i don't know how much keyframe went into it but it was a very subtle moment and i remember just seeing it in the dailies uh during beowulf which was um, Brendan Gleeson's character, it's, they're in kind of the, the king's room and Beowulf saying he's going to go off to fight the, the monster and, and Brendan Gleeson's character saying that he's going to go with him and he just has this, it's the most subtle look of the way he looks and the, the, the eye dart and it has this sadness to it and he, said, and he basically says that I'm going to go with you and it's, and it's the most subtle motion and that's the only, I remember seeing it very early in the dailies of uh, uh, coming through, so it was before there was, you know, much time for animation on top of it even, uh, and I'm sure they took it and added to it even, but it was just, it's one of those moments, it's the subtle things, it's, it's not the big, the running and extreming and all that, it's like, mm -hmm. it's those moments where it's just, there was a sadness that came through that was just like, everyone was just like, Oh, that's that looks really that looks really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think for me, it's Planet of the Apes. Uh, yeah, came as close as I've ever seen getting real emotion. That's true. I've seen the split screens. Yeah, from yeah. a performance. Have, it, have most of you seen the the demo reels of the making of from Planet of the Apes from the Rise of the Apes? And you've seen the splits between like Andy Circus and the. It's, it's, it's pretty, yeah, pretty it's good. Really great. Yeah. It's really good. I mean, that's. That's very, very close. But that was, you know, those aren't points. That was a, a camera. And uh, um, I, I might just throw it open to questions right now because it's, it's a little sooner than I expected, but, um, but why not, you know? And if, if we don't have any questions, then we'll tell stories for a little longer. <laughs> yes, sir. Who wants to answer that? Uh, I mean, I'd say one thing that people, um, it used to be a joke uh, in motion capture of if you want a guy playing basketball, don't get Bob from accounting. <laughs> that people didn't think, oh, well, I should get someone that really knows how to do this. And I've seen a lot of um, 
gone to a lot of things with, uh, with SAG and different things where actors, they're asking, what should I do to be really good at motion capture? And it's like, Act. you should be do good at whatever you do. If you're, if you're a stuntman, if you're like an actor, if you're a dramatic actor, comedian, like just, they should be good at what they do. And yeah, our it, job is just to replicate Yeah, it. it's almost yeah. like, there is, there's no such thing as a mocap actor. You're either an actor or you're not an actor. And those who actually just, the, the best mocap actors are those that can ignore all the crap on them and just do their job. Yeah. Those are the ones you love. If they're, if they're tangled and this is weird and they feel like, um, they're feeling self-conscious, all that comes through. It's the people that can truly act in it, like black box theater style, because that's what you're doing. You're on this big gray world with no props and nothing. If you can do that and nail that to the wall, you're gonna, you're, you know, you're gonna do well as an actor there. And that's what we appreciate too. I, I, you want to see that emotion, you know, as, as you know, and it, it doesn't help if you're. It also helps if you're a halfway decent stunt guy, because I have yet to do a mocap show where it's like, oh, they're just doing like a walk and talk, you know. <laughs> gonna do a little dialogue romantic comedy they're always there's always something physical going on and and that's important i mean even though yeah you're not having to leap off the giant building because you know you're gonna leap off a little thing you want a physicality to it they need to know how to sell those falls in an appropriate way not in an overacted stunt guy way i actually find that a lot of the the regular actors as opposed to the stunt guys do really well in mocap because they can do their own stunts if you want to call it that they're little micro stunts they have to do and they don't overact it which is really cool it's a, it's a big difference you see a stunt guy fall they fall a certain way and that's the cool thing about mocap is you get to make these guys hit hard you know it looks good it looks cool yeah uh pre-production casting you know you have to find the people that are going to do that you know you casting session you can find out very very quickly because you know like i said it's like motion capture is in some regards with the body is like what you see right here is what you're gonna get for the most part and if some guy's overdoing it you can tell it in a snap you know um, so it's like oh now you, now you got to get both uh, we I've seen a lot of uh, good from theater actors as well because they're used to wearing costumes and having to play without a camera because a lot of the times uh, when you think about the virtual camera too now because a lot of sets you've got one two three four virtual cameras in there or some are still like, uh, if they don't have the pre-production done, they don't know where the camera's gonna be yet. So it's, oh, we're gonna play this like theater. We're just gonna play it in the round. And then we'll place the camera in there later. So, you know, you have to have actors that can play to whatever production style you're gonna be working for that as well. Yeah, I mean, actors, actors know a lot of things uh, and a lot comes into their performance that informs their performance. If you're shooting a traditional shot, and you're doing just a close-up, um, they feel free to do things with the rest of their body that, that may never register on film. But if you're doing motion capture, that's not the case. And, uh, and just generally, you want the whole body as well as the face. And so it, it requires a focus on their part. And, and my experience is that the directing of an actor for motion capture is every bit as critical as directing an actor for a live action scene. And directors don't necessarily understand that. It actually helps them, like that's one of the things that we really stressed on you know, Avatar and then Tintin right after that was Jim was like adamant about telling them that we're in the close up. You're, we're here now and showing them that. Because they do, they do, you move differently. I don't need these, they're gonna right. move more when, they're, when it's a wider shot. When it's in the close up, they need to be told, you're in your close up now, that was one of the, uh, I think brilliant things that, that he and that he and Steven really both stuck to like when Steve Steven shot Tintin when he was doing it he shot it like a movie like they did more it wasn't like shoot one take go back at cameras it was like shoot a take okay now let's get another take now let's get another take let me get my angles it was it was pretty cool in that regard and it really did impact what you know the actors were doing at the same yeah. time so yeah I mean actors really do how many here are, have acted are there any of you been actors I encourage it for anybody who's tried. It's a it's an amazing experience. It's frightening uh, for some of us, um, but anyway, uh, it's actors need direction, and they really do. And when you you, I remember the early days of motion capture where you just try to get somebody who you know. And when you got to parameterization, you didn't have to get crazy trying to fit you know. Uh, Peter Dinklage on to Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, uh, you, 
you really, really have to work with them. I, so we're giving a lot of time to this, but I think it's Im really important, and it's important for everything. It's sort of like the example I gave of the actor who got replaced. It's just that they're going to do something different, and you, you need to recognize that. And the facial capture, um, when you capture with the motion of the character, you're going to be a lot closer to where you need to be than if you set and get them separately. So, other questions? Yeah. I'm trying to do this. I'm going to pick somebody in the back first because they never get picked on. <laughs> so that guy in the black T-shirt, you got your hand up. That's you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it, 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 okay, I, I think that you, the opportunity has to come to you. I mean, you can search it out, and then you want to work at a, on a, mo, a motion capture show, like uh, at a game studio, or so. Find somewhere where you know that motion capture is being produced, first of all, and go into that situation with an open mind, and. <clears throat> learn what that's about so that you can then integrate your keyframe animation skills with what's happening, the performance that's happening from the motion capture. But you have to, you have to find a place where the motion capture is happening, finding a job or some type of situation where you can get access to those motion capture performances, facial motion capture performances, specifically for this panel, what we're talking about, and then you can gain experience and integrate what you already know about keyframe animation and expression and all those kinds of things with the facial motion capture. Yeah, and you still need the, um, to be able to keyframe animate. It's like uh, a lot of people that, if, if you deal with facial motion capture specifically, uh, the mocap data straight out, whether you're doing like a video solve or macro solve or whatever, it's only final right out of the box if it's a background character. You know, it, it, like a hero shot, you, there just, it always needs the animators. A lot touch. of massaging, a lot yeah, of massaging. Yeah, a lot of massaging. And it, you know, it, it also d it depends on the style you're doing. If you're doing something very cartoony or doing very something real, the more real it gets, the more you have to work on it to bring that life into it. Because you know, one of the biggest limitations of facial animation is the rig. Um, you know, you talk about like, oh, I'm getting all this amazing data, this camera is so high def, or we have all these points, and you go, but the rig can't hit that shape. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why isn't he smiling like that? Because I, you know, I'm, it just we didn't doesn't do that. It. Don't it have doesn't, like that. It doesn't, it doesn't go that far. Yeah. So, uh, again, you know, this is really comes into like pre-production. So um, when it all comes down to it, it's the rigger's fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, you actually bring up a really interesting point, which is, um, you know, we talk about like going from Peter Dinklage to Arnold Schwarzenegger, and there's an obvious physical body difference there, but I find a lot of times that there are facial differences between an actor and a character, yeah. which people don't appreciate necessarily until you get down to that point where I've captured it, and it looks like this on this actor, and it doesn't look like that on my character, and why not? And there's that the process of retargeting, picking it from one to the other, which sometimes it could be something very, uh, you know, obvious of if the actor has very full lips, but your character has paper thin, yeah. tiny lips, an ooh shape is not going to look the same. Mm -hmm. Or even something as simple as the line of the mouth, a character, if they have like kind of a, a natural frown to the shape of their mouth, but your char your actor has a slight smile. It all, you know, you have these little differences which give a feel that I look at this person and it always feels like this, and the character just doesn't feel the same, and that can be partly a technical thing that we can work on, and ultimately sometimes just is, ends up being a massaging thing because it's not that the technology didn't hit it or wasn't able to; it's actually that you have something different in your input than you than you have on your out than you want in your output, and it's about what you want to get to to kind of bring it around back to that. Yeah, because you're going to have your blocking and your timing of the actor of that performance, but that last little bit to make it actually read if there's such that difference. Yeah, yeah the best execution that everybody always says, you know, the avatars, and I would go like, if you want to go look more modern examples, some of that like Halo 4 stuff, Coriana, or some of that stuff, where, where you know, the character model is 
the actor or actress or very close. Mm -hmm. So when you're engaged with that person, the, the output in terms of being able to call the shot of, yes, that looks great, a lot of that has to do with the fact that the character designs is very much impacted by the actual performer. If you try straying way off, it becomes a lot harder problem to solve. I actually had a really interesting <laughs> project where we, we had a one-to-one, -one, which we always think is, oh, it's great, we have one-to-one. -one. And we went through this whole thing, and we could not get the lips to look right, and we're like, this just is wrong. And we found out, like very far along the process, that the model, uh, an actual legitimate mm -hmm. supermodel, had model sign off, and the lips were not big enough on her model. Ah. So she actually <laughs> requested that the lips be made bigger, which then threw off all of the dialogue. So we were, just, we were like, we're perfect. No, no. Well, one of the things that uh, we, we mentioned Rise of the Apes before, and one of the reasons that Rise of the Apes was as successful as it was was that the design of the chimps were, and, the, and the other characters were humanized. The faces were not true chimpanzee faces or orangutan faces or whatever they were. There was a humanization to a, a number of them, especially the mm -hmm. Andy Circus Caesar, uh, the Andy Circus character. And there was a, and you can see it. So you can, so you can see that expressiveness. And one of the biggest problems um, that hits us all the time is integrating uh, motion capture across species. I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't particularly work, and I don't generally favor it, but, I've, uh, but it happens. And even in, in keyframe animation, I'll, I'll get to you in a second, but even in keyframe animation, maybe motion capture totally aside, if the rig, if you've got a tiger, we've all seen a tiger, um, if you have a tiger, but then you build a muscle system for that tiger that's sort of like Garfield, <clears throat> you're not going to get a tiger, you know, <laughs> and it doesn't matter how good your animator is. So it is, there's, a, there's a whole lot of considerations. When I did Golden Compass, we actually got veterinarians to work with us and tell us exactly what the muscle structure of the animals, we had 130 basic animals in the film and what that muscle structure was so that when we animated them, even when they spoke, they really used animal muscles to make those faces. So there was no human characterization to them at all. So anyway, um, there was that person I said I'd get to you all on right. that. There, right back there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that is a big struggle. I mean, actually, I'd say at this point, a, a bulk of my, my work that we've been involved in has been games in the last couple of years, more so than uh, feature films. And not because, you know, we're not good at feature films, it's just that's the kind of work that's out there right now, so that's what we've been getting into. And yeah, I mean, there's the, the, the rigging on the facial side is much more limited, but on the flip side, you know, I think that if you're able to successfully show these characters emoting. I mean, obviously it's pretty easy if it's one-to-one. -one. I mean, easier than if you're trying to have some big burly guy being played by a, a little, you know, pipsqueak guy. I mean, that's a much harder thing. But yeah, no, the, the techniques that we, you know, that started kind of on the feature side are, are, are definitely being pulled over onto the game side and the, and the engines are getting better and better. You know, it, it, it's still, at least to me personally, strangely disconnecting to a certain degree. That there's just a limitation even still, in terms, of, a lot of it has more to do with lighting, more so than the anim the animations themselves. Um, it gets kind of creepy at a point, and you kind of have to like back up. And I think I think like you know the Naughty Dot example is a great example of awesome animation. I think that like like I was saying, Coriander Coriana uh, in uh, Halo Four I thought was a really good example. She was you know a very uh, uh, a 
glowing characters, so it wasn't a direct one-to-one, -one, so the lighting didn't play as much. I think that helps, you know, if you're trying to do skin tones and everything and make that work. Still a little difficult, and I know there's guys here who are technology guys who say, oh, but my system's awesome, but I mean, you know, this is what I <laughs> and, and I'm sure there's all kinds of great examples this year of, of awesome skin shaders and all that stuff, but um, I'm, I'm really a big fan of trying to, you know, push again the performance all at once and and i love that the games are finally like catch you know catching up to that and picking up and, and carrying a, the torch because you know the feature film side is, is it's just not happening as much right now and, i mean we got a right. few like turtles has happened a few other shows but that's definitely uh, a lot of the uh, uh technology at least is actually coming from the game side these days yeah um so i i myself i've been doing a whole bunch of games the last few years as well and uh, one of the more interesting parts about it is we're, we're starting to see uh, indie devs, even some like iOS devs, trying to get into facial capture. Um, you know, they're doing uh, very limited amounts, but you know, it's it's people have been doing it for a few years now. The techniques are out there, you know. And so, people, so they're like, okay, well, you know, these these iOS, they're they're getting better and better and better, and we can try to work that in there. And I, you know, I kind of think that's interesting. Is like more and more platforms are opening up because the AAA games, there's not as many of them right. anymore as there used to be, you know? It's like the big ones are still doing, you know, hours of facial animation, but there's not as many big ones as there was. I, 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 they say, like, next year is going to be, like, 40, and there was, like, 96, like, 10 years ago or something. And so it's really... You need that next place for yeah. like facial it's, to go into. It's 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 interesting because yeah, I, I my the last few years for me as well has been mostly video games and um, Call of Duty uh, titles, Dead Space, uh, Army of Four. Like there's a lot of titles uh, enslaved, um, and uh, the games are coming up, and it's been interesting to see that the the technology that's available in games is actually moved a lot forward and there's a there are a few games which are able to have the money to spend literally on uh more on more animation and making it better um but at the same time as interesting is you know uh we've seen a lot of games where the uh triple a titles don't have the budgets that they used to because they're not doing as well and actually cutting back and not necessarily pushing animation, uh, facial animation in as much time, or even cutting back the number of joints or controls that are available on the rigs because it's literally become budget things in some cases. So it's, it's been a really interesting thing. Of there's, there's, very, there's a very small slice of titles that are actually pushing forward, trying to go uh, bring uh, large numbers of blend shapes into games, uh, improving the systems, and there's a lot of titles which are still the pretty large AAA titles but are actually cutting back and just trying to do whether it's uh, for a, uh, like the massive uh, multiplayer games, but even some of the kind of more story-driven games, kind of bringing it back because it is it's still an expensive process, and we haven't really yeah. been extremely successful in making it super friggin' cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. We have time for maybe one more question, so um, maybe two. So uh, I was wondering, like for body capture, is very well known. And uh, there's, there's some best practices associated with that. You, know, you can target your controls, or you can drive the joints directly in space. Um, have facial rigs started to standardize? Are you seeing similar practices at various uh, studios, or um, is it still kind of the wild west? It's standardizing. <laughs> uh, I was lucky enough to be at Giant Studios while they were working on Halo and seeing some of the facial rigs coming, getting developed out there at the moment. And at Quantic Dream, after they did Beyond Two Souls, looking at what they did with Alan Page, which was pretty impressive. Um, I think the rigging side of things has come a long way because of the motion capture, because there used to be no way really to have as much flexibility with changing the performance before or after you've captured as there is today. And that's where most of the work's been going into being able to post-animate or change or manipulate the performances. But it's also getting extremely technical to the point of even a company like Microsoft can have one rig that is going to be its standard facial rig. <laughs> Maybe not everyone can afford to <laughs> go that much in depth down. But I think because of that, everyone benefits. It will become 
more widely known what's being done and how to do that. Yeah. So that's making leaps and bounds practically as much as the capture technology itself. Yeah, and then again, you've got the limitations, whether it's running in a, a real-time space like a game engine or pre-render, because in pre-render, you obviously can do a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the game space, every engine has its own little limitations or uh, resources allocated to animation, and specifically, you know, the face. It's like, oh, we, you know, we want to spend more CPU on blowing shit up. And, uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you still get... You still get um, uh, bones and joints, and you still get blends, you get combinations, uh, hybrid rigs as well. Uh, you know, I think in the game space it's still kind of wild westy. But you know, there's a few houses out there that are really, uh, that, that build rigs. It's like, this is what we do. And now, you know, more and more people yeah. are going to them because they, they do it well. That's, that's what you're seeing, consolidation of talent. Yeah. The guys who really nail the rigs to the wall band together and go, we do this well. <laughs> and now, let's go sell ourselves as those guys. And that actually benefits everybody yeah. because you can hire a smaller studio that specializes in just that, have them do what they do well, and then, and then leverage that. And that's, you know, across the board, I think, a great thing. Yeah, I, well, I was going to say, yeah, I think it, I, I kind of stand on the side where I feel like it's a little bit of the Wild West still because, you know, as a service provider, we see a lot of different rigs, a lot of different control systems. And just the number of joints, the number of controls, the way the controls are laid out. Um, and one of the things that definitely in the last few years that um, we've seen is, the, is the, the guys that know how to do control rigs and how to build a rig that works well for motion capture. Um, and the guys that have really learned how to make, to replicate a human face as opposed to making something that works really well for just animation where there's a complete freedom of you can do anything just as long as you add another shape or you just pull the slider further there has to be a more of a realistic connection to the um, to the rigging um, as if it is like a real face that you know something's connected to the face and I need this to really act in a very specific way in a very controlled way and have a little bit less flexibility than maybe you would have if you're going really ex exaggerated keyframe but the guys that are, you know, the rigging is really, that's kind of the next thing that's kind of moving forward that mocap and that have to work well together or animation to, for that matter. We'll have one more question real quick and then we're gonna go. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a rigger. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> in most cases, does it feel like it's usually the rigging that's behind? I mean, can you kind of cover that, or is it if you don't have the animators, or the technology, or like the cameras capturing, what's usually the furthest behind? Oh. Hmm. Well, the rigging does still have issues in dealing with the, um, the data coming through from the capture. I think once we get more into surface capture, and being able to get more surface detail that isn't rig driven, that might improve. Um, but we do tend to suffer an awful lot from when there's a big fight scene. And if you look at the faces on the video, there's just a huge amount going on in there. But the way that we usually solve that onto the rig now tends to either uh, average that out or lose it completely. So those areas are tough, tough problems. I, th I just want to add that, you know, from a supervisor's perspective and an animation director's perspective, <clears throat> the most success I've ever had was um, when the riggers and the animators essentially all worked in the same room, you know. Yeah. Um, it, they aren't, riggers are animators. <clears throat> and so there's a, uh, when you have the, a confluence of the skill sets of, of people who focus on animation, people who focus on rigging, in the same space, um, you get much better work. Um, and everybody's happier, you know. Mm -hmm. You solve problems together and it, it really works out well. Um, so, uh, and I'm the one who made the offensive joke, so I, <laughs> I, I apologize. That's you know. on you. <clears throat> No, I, I just, I, I would echo the same comment that, I mean, some of uh, our most, uh, I always believe that, um, the more steps in the process that people know, the better the team is. Because if you know someone that you're not just throwing it over the fence of, well, this is as good as I can get, and I just throw it over to the next guy, and that they're completely responsible for it. When you know more pieces of the process, even if you only know them 
enough to be dangerous and not really actually do them, but you understand that this could be a problem down the line, it, whether it's you know on set or in the rigging or in animation, that the more pieces of that you know, the more uh, successful you will be at getting a completed process. Of course, remember that the people who pay the bills don't really like to see that happen. <laughs> they want to be able to define exactly what you do so they know how much it costs. You know. <laughs> That's right. That doesn't always work. Yeah. Um, well, I want to thank the panel because I, I think this was great today and I, and I hope you all liked it. <laughs>